Smoking kills 7 million people every year worldwide. Should you choose to smoke, it could cut a decade off your life and even harm those around you. Despite their limited avenues, tobacco companies continue to spend $9 billion a year on advertising. The dangers of smoking have been known since the 1930s, at least, but they're largely ignored because of who discovered and promoted many. Instead, new narratives were created that they were safe, made you look cool, and the perfect way to relax. Hello and welcome to Animation Propaganda. Last time, we took a trip to Latin America with Walt Disney. Today, we are taking up smoking and looking at how cartoons promoted or discouraged tobacco use. Now, the history of tobacco use dates back centuries, if not millennia, so we are going to be jumping into the 20th century, for simplicity's sake, to the beginning of modern cigarette advertising. Tobacco has been marketed in many ways, sometimes with contradicting messages. Smoking is rebellious. Individuals and free thinkers pick this brand, you know, leather jackets, motorcycles, fast cars. On the other hand, 9 out of 10 smokers agree this brand is best. Cigarette commercials are full of young, beautiful people, telling you nothing compares to their brand. It's very popular, it sells the most. Not to mention the fact that many people become smokers on account of peer pressure. Smoking also taps into fragile masculinity, uh, real men smoke with this brand, the use of rugged cowboy iconography, and of course, romance, <laughs> women, smokers of this brand fuck, more or less. When appealing to women, the theme has traditionally been independence and equality. <laughs> there were actually laws against women smoking in public in America early in the 20th century, as it had long been seen as an immoral or inappropriate thing for women to do. This restrictiveness made it a target of first wave feminism, with smoking being seen as a protest, and tobacco companies were quick to capitalize. As early as 1900, cigarettes were marketed to women as liberating, but the most famous campaign came in 1929 with the Torches of Freedom. Seeing the potential to increase their consumer base, the American tobacco company consulted Edward Bernays, who we talked about in the advertising episode. Bernays is considered the father of public relations. He was a relative of Sigmund Freud and believed companies could sell their products by tapping into their customers' desires. For the American tobacco company, Bernays organized a demonstration during the 1929 New York Easter Day Parade. He hired a group of women to march and smoke cigarettes, dubbed Torches of Freedom. Though this term had been used before, Bernays' publicity stunt popularized it. It was a very successful campaign, and the number of women smokers would nearly quadruple over the next six years. That same year, the paramilitary wing of the Nazi party, the Strapteilung, began manufacturing and selling cigarettes as a means to fund their operation. The convenience of pre-rolled cigarettes, still a relatively new concept, had led to an increase in smoking in Western countries, as well as respiratory illnesses, like lung cancer. It didn't take long for the correlation to be seen or assumed, and a paper linking the two was published by German Franz Lickant, also in 1929. His research partly formed the basis of the Nazis' anti-smoking movement, despite being purged from the party in 1934. Hitler's own distaste for smoking also contributed, as did the fertility issues cigarettes cause. These threatened the Nazis' idea of bodily purity. There were also the predictable racist reasons. They believed tobacco was payback for white people getting indigenous people hooked on booze, which is a weird way to shift the blame, but you know, what do you expect with Nazis? The perceived association to Nazis damaged anti-smoking efforts for decades, uh, not only for the obvious reasons, but they were also proven to be largely ineffective and did little to actually curb smoking. Looking at America around this time paints a very different picture. Cigarettes and tobacco were heavily ingrained in military culture. They were even included in soldiers' rations. Marketing material from this time also features lineups on account of shortages and these forcing <laughs> inferior brands on people. Even though they were not heavily promoted, the dangers or harms of smoking were somewhat known. This led to the creation of so-called modified risk cigarettes. Filtered cigarettes came out of this, same with cigarettes branded as light or mild. You know, smoking hurts the throat, <laughs> it's irritating, and these products were advertised as healthy alternatives. In what is perhaps the most evil of all tobacco ads, doctors appear on screen to announce more of them smoke camels than any other brand. Menthol cigarettes were at one point promoted as medicinal, easy on the throat if you have a cold, with the most popular brand being Cool with a K. Cool's mascot was an adorable penguin, Willy, who first appeared in animated form in the 1935 short Cool Penguins. This featured a group of penguins fleeing hunters who want to eat them. They make their way to America, New York in the middle of a heat wave, here they see an ad for Cool Cigarettes, with Willie being promoted as from Louisville. They then head to Kentucky, where they all get jobs at the Cool Cigarette Factory. Here their responsibilities include ensuring the tobacco leaves are cold. They do this with a thermometer. They also blend and inspect them before adding ice to further cool them down. They then roll, brand, and even test them before personally delivering them off to market. They drop a ton on New York, and these cigarettes are so cool it begins to snow, and the short ends with the Statue of Liberty endorsing Cool. 
This was obviously for promotional purposes, highlighting their QA practices. <laughs> Penguins don't actually uh, make the cigarettes, at least I hope they don't. Willie would later appear in animated commercials where he assumed various professions and interacted with live-action smokers. Penguins are associated with cold weather, cool, like cools are in your throat. This was the point most of the spots made. Cool's main rival was Spud Cigarettes, who had their own cool animated spokesperson, a snowman, that really resembled Frosty. It should go without saying, menthol cigarettes are no healthier than traditional cigarettes, but they are more addictive and much easier to smoke. They are seen as starter cigarettes, which makes it all the more fucked up that companies disproportionately target African Americans with that for menthols. It's said that 9 out of 10 African American smokers smoke menthols. Cool, <laughs> the word meaning fashionable, came from African American vernacular English, and Cool, the brand, exploited this by incorporating it into their marketing. Tobacco companies also place more ads in magazines geared towards black culture, and advertise heavily in black communities. That's pretty unethical, even by tobacco standards. Like most companies, those in the tobacco industry have relied on product placement and celebrity endorsements. These have included, most strangely, sports stars like Joe DiMaggio and Jesse Owens. Tobacco advertising had long appeared in magazines and print, but the advent of television gave them a powerful new avenue to sell their products through sponsoring programs, commercials. Tobacco had a huge presence on early television. Here is John Wayne, Rod Serling, and Desi Arnaz shilling cigarettes, <laughs> all of whom died of smoking-related cancers. Smoking would also kill B. Benaderet, Gene Vanderpill, Alan Reed, and Mel Blanc, the voices of the four main characters on The Flintstones. The Flintstones was the first adult-oriented animated sitcom. It looked at a family from the Stone Age through the lens of then, modern convenience, and that included smoking. The first sponsor of The Flintstones was Winston Cigarettes, now the most famous spot and the one I'm sure many of you have seen already, finds Fred and Barney relaxing uh, with a Winston while their wives Betty and Wilma do yard work. Another found Fred buying a pack and hearing all the benefits from a shopkeep, not that he needed to, he was already sold on Winston's, and every episode of the first couple seasons ended with Fred lighting one for Wilma. While this can be shocking to modern eyes, to be fair, The Flintstones aired in primetime and was geared towards adults. Still, that didn't stop ABC from dropping Winston as a sponsor in favor of Welch's Juice. As a side note, The Flintstones would later promote bush beer <laughs> before cleaning up their act. Uh, obviously, Flintstones chewable vitamins and fruity pebbles, but they also became spokespeople for the American Cancer Society. In 1966, they appeared in this public service announcement, educating viewers of the seven warning signs of cancer. Around this time, a fellow Hanna-Barbera creation Yogi Bear also got in on the action. He started with Boo Boo in this PSA about the dangers of smoking to nature and our bodies. By the late 1960s, public attitudes towards smoking had begun to change. In 1964, the Surgeon General of the United States published a report that provided evidence tobacco was harmful based on long-term studies. Two years later, smoking packages required warning labels by law. Because of this confirmation, a number of lawsuits were brought against tobacco companies for making and promoting a dangerous product. <laughs> These were initially unsuccessful, as Big Tobacco argued customers assumed the risks when they smoked, uh, while still denying the product was as harmful as science suggested. Still, the tide was turning. The American Cancer Society released these PSAs discouraging tobacco use. They also produced the short The Huffless Puffless Dragon in 1964. This features a badass dragon who speaks in rhyme. <laughs> he is revered, the female dragons thirst after him, but the plot actually revolves around a free-thinking dragon who refuses to smoke. Throughout, he is confronted by peer pressure, he stands firm that smoking kills, and the smokers turn to violence. However, smoking has left them weak and out of breath. Uh, no competition, surely, for our non-smoker. Eventually, the badass dragon challenges him to an arm wrestling competition. A uh, non-smoker wins and exposes the badass, who, in the end, dies. A few years later, Johnny Smoke showed up. This was a short PSA produced by the Heart Association, featuring an outlaw cigarette creature that is presented as a cowboy killer. The narrator asks, how many saddles will be empty tonight on account of Johnny Smoke? Calling this animation is generous. <laughs> it is extremely limited. Uh, it's basically still images, but the message still gets through. Now, a lot of what we've looked at so far is from an American perspective. Uh, up next, we're going to see something from the UK, 1967's Dying for a Smoke. Here, we are introduced to Nicotine, a pun we'll be seeing again. <laughs> he is the devil that gets kids hooked on smoking. He disguises himself as a British biker and offers smokes to school-aged children. After smoking, the children are transported to an alternate world where everything is grimy and the smokers are depicted as slaves. A doctor appears to present the health risks, which one of the children ignores. That puts him on the road to an early grave, which is very cryptic, very creepy. <laughs> he is eventually saved, kicks the habit, and beats Nicotine in a series of sports. 
Anti-smoking messages have been the subject of cartoons before. Uh, Goofy's No Smoking in 1951 offered a satirical look at both smoking and cigarette advertising. Uh, it's shown as a nasty habit Goofy is trying to kick, with most of the humor coming from his struggles to do so. Uh, there is also a, the novel tune No Ifs, Ands, and Buts from 1954. Uh, this has a similar plot with a cat trying to quit and the mishaps that come from that. Uh, this was actually quite a popular plot as it also appeared in 1961's In the Nicotine. This had the twist of a man being committed to an institution to kick his habit. But uh, none of these had the explicit messaging seen in those that were produced after the Surgeon General's report. Smoking would be dealt another blow in 1970 when U.S. President Richard Nixon banned cigarette advertising from TV and radio. This severely limited the reach of tobacco companies, especially to children. The tobacco industry, like all, relies on new customers, and that means getting them hooked while they're young. Uh, this has been done through marketing. Obviously, they can't directly advertise to children, but they have other ways, uh, showing young people smoking, also flavored cigarettes and other tobacco products, uh, broadly colored packaging, <laughs> and in some territories, getting a pack of cigarettes is as simple as putting change into a vending machine. Without the ability to advertise on TV, tobacco companies had to get more creative. This led to one of the most blatant campaigns targeting children ever, Camel's Joe Camel. Joe Camel was an anthropomorphic camel whose design is essentially what your divorced uncle thinks is cool. He was laid back, he wore sunglasses, hung out at bars. Joe Camel was based off of Old Joe, the camel on Camel's packaging. He was created in 1974 as part of a French ad campaign, but was rediscovered and first used in America during Camel's 75th anniversary celebrations in 1988. Now, I couldn't find any Joe Camel animation, but from the design, it's pretty clear they were going for a cartoon character. It was suggested in a medical paper published in 1991 that nearly the same amount of kids could link Joe to cigarettes as Mickey Mouse to Disney. Data showed that 32% of cigarettes sold to children uh, illegally <laughs> were camels following Joe's debut. Uh, previously, it had been 1%. It was also alleged that teenage smokers accounted for $476 million of camel sales. Uh, previously, it had been $6 million. R.J. Reynolds, Camel's parent company, denied they were targeting children. However, this controversy led to a lot of public pressure and a lawsuit, which was settled out of court, and the mascot was retired in 1997. The 80s and 90s saw anti-smoking interest groups aggressively targeting tobacco use. One of the most iconic anti-smoking ads was this one, featuring a woman smoking through a hole in her neck. This is known as a tracheostomy and is the result of mouth or throat cancer. The new anti-smoking movement also gave ways to new ways of quitting. Aids to help people quit had been around since the 60s, Flavet, anti-smoking pills, but in the 90s, new aids emerged, the nicotine patch and Nicorette gum. Both of these administered nicotine without the smoker having to actually inhale smoke. During this period, we also got these gorgeous Superman PSAs animated by Richard Williams, uh, who is probably best known for his work on Roger Rabbit. Once again, we get the nicotine pun, this time it's used for a supervillain who tries to get the children of Metropolis to smoke. Thankfully, Superman is there to save them. Three PSAs were produced, with the theme being Never Say Yes to a Cigarette, which is kind of awkward, considering he also produced commercials for several cigarette brands around this time. Disney would weigh in in 1981 with Smoking, The Choice is Yours. Like the ones we saw earlier, this appropriates cowboy culture and highlights acceptance and peer pressure as the reason why many start smoking. Uh, in the end, the main character learns it's better to be yourself than what someone else wants you to be, uh, which is a great lesson. Anti-smoking messages would also appear in children's cartoons, like Sonic Says from Sonic the Hedgehog, but just how effective were these measures, if at all? Today, nearly half of the amount of people smoke that did in the 1950s, which is great. Youth smoking is also down, however, vaping has emerged as a new threat, and much of the resources that once went to fighting smoking are now directed there. Longer-term studies uh, on vaping are now coming in, and uh, it doesn't look too great. After all that, I kind of want a cigarette, <laughs> but I have quit. Uh, I am an ex-smoker, and if you or someone you know is trying to quit, you can drive them to the link I've put in the description for resources. Uh, we are going to be wrapping this season up next time with a look at election campaigns and how cartoons have run for president. If you enjoyed this video and haven't seen it, check out episode 3 on drugs. It's very similar. Give us a thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't, and please consider supporting us on Patreon. That's the only place to see Century of Schlock, our exploration of trash media from the 20th century. Uh, we are currently wrapping up Season 1 on Animated Smut, patreon.com slash portraits. As always, thank you so much for interest in this channel, and thanks for watching. Stay safe out there.